Hello and welcome to, well, another rambling bit of news. I'm here in the southwest of France and Donovan, as usual, is still stuck in Joburg. We obviously haven't gone anywhere since the last time. I am staying sane. Stuck in Joburg. Despite this... <laughs> stuck in I'm, Joburg. Hey, I'm well, entering thank the you. fifth, fifth week of uh, shutdown. I'm keeping sane thanks to this fella. Spock, my trusty giant schnauzer. We have a couple of minis around. I don't know where they are at the moment. But uh, yeah, I've not been Don for the last four and a bit weeks. I haven't been anywhere further than one kilometer from my house. So that's my lockdown. How's yours going? Uh, yesterday I went to the shops. It was my first time leaving the house in a week. Ah, it oh. was so, all the pretty lights. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Outside civilization. Like I do feel like a troll. I mean, look at my hair's getting all shaggy, my beard's all shaggy, there's no barbers, there's no nothing. And I'm not cutting this on my own. That's going to just be a disaster. Oh, so, I don't know. I think you should. Uh, well, I, I will definitely have my own mop cut by the time we do this news again next week. My wife has said she just can't stand it anymore. So, uh, razor's coming out. I'll be sat in the garden. I'll take a bit of video of that because it's bound to be <laughs> terrifying. Uh, and the results will probably be terrifying as well. Listen, Don, we're both doing the same thing, which is trawling news sites and YouTube and just anything, trying to find out what's going on in the world of bikes because we can't ride any of the damn things. So uh, what's on top of your list to talk about? Okay, as usual, on top of my list is always MotoGP because, you know, it's glorious Why in not? every way. Even now when it's not in fact happening. Um, there's been some little developments here. Now, Dorna is the company that runs MotoGP. They've, they have actually do a, a damn good job. I mean, you look at, for example, Formula One is saying, well, with this lockdown, we might lose teams, which is sort of the Formula One mentality. Yeah, we're the bosses, we're the kings, you you lots of peasants, you know, do whatever. Whereas Dorna is sort of saying, well, we're not going to lose teams because we will take the hit. We will actually give, they're actually funding teams. They're giving them money just to stay afloat, just to cover costs. Uh, so that when all this ends, the teams can come back again, which is a very different approach. I mean, they're going to get a negative balance. Dorna will get a negative balance, but they will have a series to return to. Uh, more things that they're doing, they're talking about uh, doing closed races. Now, basically what that means is the races will take place, no spectators, no media, no hospitality, nothing, only a skeleton crew. So it'll be filmed, of course, so we can all watch it on TV, but it'll be a skeleton crew in the pits. So a complete, almost completely empty pits apart from those that are needed. In fact, Dorna even asked the teams to send a list of uh, essential people in the crew. So no PR, no nothing like that. Only the essential crew. Basically, they're just going to eat pies and whatever they can scavenge. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, they're, they're thinking about when all the travel bans end, holding races like that. And I quite like that idea because, quite frankly, if you're sitting watching on TV, I mean, it's nice to see crowds and stuff, but when the race is happening, who cares? And I'm sure the riders don't yeah, really absolutely. care. Yeah, absolutely. What difference is it going to make? So I presume if they do this, if the travel bans lift early enough, um, look, I think with this pandemic thing going on, there's always the chance of these second waves. I know here in France, the biggest event of the year is the Tour de France. Two wheels, but unfortunately without an engine. And that's when the whole world of cycling comes to France and then travels around France. So they've postponed that. It normally kicks off in July. It's till the end of August. So mm. they seem relatively confident that these sort of events might uh, kick off again. I presume then Dorna will be thinking, hopefully, of still getting some kind of season in before the end of this year then. Well, I mean, they were thinking the race, is, at the moment, the season's a 20 lap, a 20 round season. They're thinking a 10 round season will still work. I mean, it's better yes. than nothing. And you just go to the rounds that are not so badly affected. You know, one in Spain, one or two in Spain, one in, well, I don't know so much about Italy. But I mean, you can go to places like Australia and all of those. I mean, they're not, they're not too bad. I mean, Australia will probably have, a, will allow a round of Phillip Island, one of these closed events. They probably will. I mean, people are seeing Australia, they've got a lockdown, but, uh, you know, carry on working kind of thing. So that would be a lot of fun. Um, That'd be brilliant. What have, you got on, what have you got on your side? Well, I just, I think on the back of that, if you stick with racing, I, I like the whole idea that's been talked about because Dorna obviously now controls both Superbike as well as MotoGP, which people mm. have talked about being, you know, possibly not the right sort of thing. But if they manage to organise it logically, then there's the potential in the future when we return to anything that approaches normality, that they will in fact be able to run, or they're talking about running the Superbike series over a kind of 
a winter period, a Northern Hemisphere winter period, which would then mean you had world-class racing the year round. So you'd have your MotoGP mainly over the summer months in Europe. And then when we all get depressed for four or five months when MotoGP is non, then they'll run the World Superbike Series. Look, it has some drawbacks in that occasionally riders jump from one series to another. So there's a bit of an overlap. Imagine winning a World Superbike Championship. You want to get promoted to MotoGP, but the, the seasons overlap a bit. I don't think that's anything to stop it happening. Europe in winter, not a great place to race. But, you know, the Southern Hemisphere does exist, as we know, because we live in it most of the time. Well, I know so they can you stop ignoring us. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I came back here for love, man, to be with my yeah. wife. But when it comes to bikes, and I'll be dogs. back in South Africa. <laughs> And my dogs, yeah, obviously, the true loves of my life. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's got potential for Superbike to run in winter. And then I've kind of ignored it, uh, but there is a certain bit of controversy going on with a young MotoGP rider, not that young anymore, actually, called uh, Andrea Iannone, who, well, according to my mate Don, you said he's been... Ba what is it? It's an 18-month ban, I think, he's received. Yeah. For being innocent, I think, is the way you put it. <laughs> well, okay. What happened was it at Sepang, the Malaysian round, he was caught with, I forget the name, it's some steroid in his, I think you yeah, might know. It's some steroid in his I did write it down system. at one point. Drostanolone, which is a steroid that was originally used to treat breast cancer, but is in fact often used these days to help from injury recovery. It helps you recover from operations and that sort of thing. So one imagines, given that he did have a serious period of falling off, that the allegations are that he would have used that type of steroid to help him recover more quickly. Well, here's the thing, okay, he was he tested negative for all of that while he was properly recovering. But there are theories, and I've actually just had a second one, uh, you can get contaminated by eating certain meats, especially meats in places like Malaysia that are not as tightly controlled. You can ingest, he had a very, very small sample of it in his bloodstream, very, very small. In fact, Dorna themselves, or FIM or whatever the regulatory body is, said that it, they actually believe him. You know, that it is correct that he could have accidentally ingested some of it completely. Unfortunately, the rules say it is your responsibility as an athlete to make sure you don't consume any. You need to watch, watch your food, yeah. watch what you eat. So they still, despite being innocent, gave him a ban. In fact, actually, I don't think it might be, you said it treats breast cancer. I don't know if you've seen Andrea Iannone. He is... Quite a porn star. <laughs> Literally, I'm quite oh, really? sure. I thought you were. <laughs> I thought you were about to call him a tit. <laughs> no, no, hang on. Which is, by the way, <laughs> go on. No, he, okay, because if you look at the guy, I mean, he's, he's, his Instagram is just pictures of him in his underwear. I'm pretty sure he has a channel on oh. Pornhub or something. So maybe with all the kind of attention he gets from of the feminine sorts, I mean, one of them must have breast cancer. So maybe you know, who knows? You know. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, he's just helping out his uh, fellow stars. I, I kind of agree with you. I've always been a mad fan of Ian Oni, Crazy Joe, especially in Moto2 days, even in MotoGP days. You know, great fun to watch. I think he's taken his eye off the ball the last couple of years. He seems to be preoccupied with his, let's just call it his alternative career. I believe he had some kind of jaw sculpting surgery, which kept him off the bike for a bit because it got infected. Uh, and with all due respect, he's the only rider to have accidentally ingested something and I think it's WADA or someone like that a body that controls your all the drugs in sport and stuff you know he's a silly boy I think is the best we can say we hope to see him racing again because he does add a yeah. lot to the MotoGP grid he is but, very cool you know I don't particularly think he's necessarily innocent and um, it is a shame okay moving on from that uh, the ever continuing story of Norton I yes. believe it seems that the Indian company TVS, which I think is partnered up with uh, BMW, is it, to do the G G310? It's those mm. guys there. And it seems that they might actually have acquired the name now. Uh, 16 billion pounds, which in our South African Mi land is million, like not 500 billion. trillion, you know, Six, uh, 16 million, sorry. <laughs> Jeez, uh, okay. Yeah, 16 Still billion is a lot for Norton. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, they got, they got um, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, 16 million pounds. That sounds better. It's still like 500 tr trillion rand. Um, yeah. yeah, they bought the name, uh, which is kind of interesting because they've already sold. I mean, Norton, Stuart Garner, we all know. Uh, yeah, there's quite a bit it's of a very naughty boy. He's a very naughty allegedly. boy. Yeah, basically, he, took, he allegedly took a whole lot of people's pensions and uh, all sorts of things going on there. Uh, we did report last time that TVS was interested in it. And now, they've, apparently, they've bought it. And here's the interesting thing. I mean, okay, 
you kind of worry about all this sort of thing because when someone like TVS buys a brand like Norton, you kind of think, well, they're going to take their little sort of, how do I put it nicely? Commuter machines, you know, uh, yes. well-priced yeah. economical commuter machines and then put a Norton badge on it, which would be yes. a travesty. That would just be, yes, it would. no, you can't do that. But they are saying they want to maintain Norton as an international brand. That is what the... The, whoever the spokesman was who spoke on behalf of TVS has said they want to maintain Norton as an iconic international brand. So with a bit of luck, we will still see proper Nortons, you know, like we know, the, the classic looking things. I, don't, I doubt they're going to build a 1000 CCV4 race bike like Mr. Garner wanted to do. But hopefully this is, I mean, the brand will be there and it'll still be run properly. Who knows? Maybe even still in the UK. I uh, don't know. Maybe. Yeah, still there. I mean, they haven't really done much. I did test uh, the Nortons a couple of years ago and, and they were, quite frankly, utterly horrible um, mm. and fell apart and overpriced and just terrible in every way. So they can't do any worse with it. Um, and I think TVS is successful enough of a company and, and has a, a deep reservoir of cash it can draw on. So they might actually do a proper job with it. I do notice, however, that there was... Uh, I think it's a 650 twin engine or a 600 twin engine, which was basically half of that V4. The rights to that have been bought by Zongshen, I think it is. So it, it feels like the thing's being broken up piecemeal. Uh, yeah. Let's just hope that it doesn't kind of dis disappear into a cloud of more debt and broken dreams. Moving on from them, I want to touch on a bike that uh, has just been announced uh, very recently, uh, the Honda Rebel. Now, you remember the Rebel... I don't, obviously, because I've forgotten. What was it, 600, 650? The Reb, you know, the Rebel, the Cruiser, quite yes. possibly it's cheap and cheerful. It never came to South Africa because Honda South Africa, for some reason, decided that a cheap Cruiser wouldn't sell for some reason. But anyway, uh, they've now announced a Rebel 1100 with a twin, which is coming from the Africa twin. Makes sense. Will be very, very affordable indeed still incredibly ugly and I have got absolutely no desire to ride it. So, uh, mm. Don, when it does appear, that's one for you, me old son. Ah, uh, you're so kind. Now, remember a little while ago, Honda brought out, there was that C, I think it was called a C1300 or something cruiser. It was meant to be this custom cruiser. And remember how bloody awful it was. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. Yes. It, yeah, it was meant to be this custom thing. And I mean, it didn't look bad from far. As soon as you went close, it was all made of plastic. In a yes, very kind of un-Honda kind of thing. I mean, all those shiny bits were all plastic. I mean, no, 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 no. And, and uh, Honda, I can't remember off the top of my head, it doesn't really, you're thinking of Valkyrie, Goldwingy type thing. Uh, it doesn't really do cruisers very, in fact, the Japanese as a whole don't really do the cruiser thing. Well, well, the Valkyrie was actually Massively done in America well. by, with Honda in America. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, if you want to do a cruiser Honda, give it to the Americans. Yeah, basically. So look, it will be, BMW obviously gone big there with the R18. Uh, that will be hugely expensive. The Honda will be the other end of the scale will be very affordable. But I have to say, uh, you can see it on your screen now. It, it really is a pretty ugly thing. I walked past the 600, 650 version or whatever at Eichmer last year. And um, I don't know, I thought someone had dropped a piano on it or something and squashed it down the middle and the tank's <laughs> horrible. The whole look and balance uh... of it is just is just terrible. So uh, we'll move on from that. Uh, I do want to mention, um, I've read about this bloke before, actually. There's a, I can't remember his name. Let me look at my uh, notes. It's a Scandinavian chappy by the name of <laughs> Skirk Lukasen. I know his <laughs> second name is Lukasen. So he's been riding his R1 around the world for the last few years. Uh, by the way, this is a, uh, I think it's like a, a year 2000 R1. Certainly looks like that, 2000, 2001. Uh, he's done 320,000 kilometres on it so far. Wow. And now, having visited every far-flung part of the globe, he wants to go to the North Pole. Which is a very, very silly idea that I like a lot. So obviously he's got to adapt this bike, but massive uh, fat tyres uh, on it. I think 40 centimetres wide at the front. Uh, adaptive swing arm gives him 60 centimetres at the rear. Uh, Putelina developed a, a new oil, which means it'll still stay liquid down to minus 50 degrees centigrade. His route will go from Alaska, right across Alaska, across most of Canada, which is about 1,700 miles, which is about a billion kilometres, and then 1,000 miles across the sea ice of, of the North, to get to the North Pole. 1,000 miles of sea ice, which again is nearly 200 million kilometres. So that is an extraordinary achievement. He will be pulling a, uh, uh, a trailer to begin with, with wheels, 
And then when he gets to the ice, he'll whip the wheels off and it turns into a sledge. And uh, yeah, he'll be pulling the sledge with all his food and that sort of stuff all the way there. The thing he has worked out, given the length of the journey, he cannot pull his own fuel. So he'll have a backup Jeep with someone just pulling the fuel so he can keep topped up. However, I still think if he manages to get there, wow, brilliant, utterly, utterly brilliant. Wow, okay. Oh, big story for you. So you can dream while you're at home in the lockdown. I'm, I'm dreaming of epic adventures like that. What, that is? Let me correct that. I'm dreaming of sending Don on epic adventures like that. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the North Pole, do the South Pole. I will say, well done, social distancing, like, to the max, right there. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's no coronavirus in the North Pole. They've had zero <laughs> cases thus far. He might take it. What else have we got? Where are we? We've got a few more Hang minutes on. before we bore ourselves to death. Hey, I tell Hang you. on, no, oh, no, no, on. No. your turn. This, this makes me very excited, and uh, I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, Ducati has partnered yes. with a Danish company called Lego. And they have built a Lego Ducati Panigale V4R. Take a look at this thing. It is... <laughs> oh, that is you so You like cool. it? I love it. Oh, I love it. You are it. a child, sir. A what, sorry? You are a child. No, I am a child. Now, okay, uh, this model, I've got some notes here. It is 646 pieces, uh, 32 centimeters by 16 centimeters by 8 centimeters, so sort of that big. So here's the thing. Okay, it's got working suspension, which a lot of... Uh, models from lego have it's got working steering it's even got a little tft dash obviously it doesn't work it's a sticker but anyway who cares the thing that this bike has that all the others do it also it rolls you know which is something new the thing that this model has that no other model has had before it's got a two-speed gearbox it's got a gearbox on it it's got a two-speed gearbox now i don't it's obviously it's not motorized itself you have to motorize it by pushing it along and, I, and I, I can only imagine that a two-speed gearbox means it's got two pushing experiences. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is, I mean, if you look at this video, they've got... I remember last time you were talking about the R18 promo and how it made you throw up a little bit. Uh, look yes. at this one. They've got this really good-looking sort of artistic guy on this wooden work workbench, you know, looking all very artistic, and he's putting together... A model for Lego. <laughs> a Lego model. <laughs> now, okay, hang on. That guy is not what a Lego builder looks like. That guy, in fact, yes. is out getting laid somewhere. He do, they do not work. If you want to know what a Lego builder actually looks like, it looks like this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is what a Lego builder looks like. All right. And uh, yeah, on that note, I have to say Donovan's absolutely right because he isn't out getting lucky anywhere very often, believe me. <laughs> so, yes, your proper Lego uh, builder. Uh, nice one. I imagine it will be incredibly expensive, seeing as uh, it's got a it's, Ducati okay, sticker Okay, well, on it's it. going to be sold through Ducati dealers. They're hoping to have it oh, out right. by the 1st of June. It's going to cost 59.99 euros which is about 500 gazillion rand. No, it's actually, if you convert it straight, it's about 1,200 rand. Uh, it'll yeah, probably okay. be a little bit more expensive than that. Yeah. That's not, not so bad. bad. Yeah, it's all right. And people, if you get one in South Africa, you just got to give it to Don and he'll build it for you. There you go. No problem. He'll be happy as well. Just continually happy. Um, what else? Okay, Don, I want to speak to you. Don and I often argue about uh, MotoGP and things like that. He's good, he's not, he's better, he'll be quicker, that bike's rubbish, that one's not. Don, we've been arguing, I remember one argument we had was about uh, the leg dangling thing. And yes. I said, well, obviously they're doing it for a reason. Uh, I don't quite know what the reason is. I even tried practicing it once on a, on a launch and, and nearly, nearly launched myself into the bushes. <laughs> Um, I, I've never done it. Don's never done it when we were racing. Uh, and you quite rightly pointed out that someone as fast as Lorenzo, he never did it. But a lot of the other guys did. And I think you mentioned something along the lines of actually it was um, it was somebody copying. Who started it? I think Rossi. Probably. It was Rossi. Remember when he punted Gibbonau off at Jerez, <laughs> last corner, little dash. And he stuck his foot out because his front wheel was busy locking up. Um, so he did it then, and then afterwards he just carried on doing it. And then everybody else okay. started doing it, and it's... it's Okay, you carry on, I'll, I'll reply. How's that? Okay, well, I just want to... We'll, we'll give you a link, and I'll, we'll put some of this uh, up on the screen for you. Uh, one of the best videos I've ever seen explaining this come from uh, what we would call Sylvain Gwintoli, 
which I'm pretty sure his name is actually Sylvain Gantouli. Obviously, Frenchman, World Superbike champion, has raced uh, the Suzuki MotoGP, I think, as a stand-in. He does the leg down, and he's just brought a video out explaining why this leg dangling has come on. And basically, it boils down to a variety of factors, which is based around the fact that the tyres and the braking have just got so incredibly, stupidly tough on MotoGP bikes that um, they've had to adapt their style and the tyres uh, and the fact that the, because they now got even more lean angle than before, the pegs are higher than before. So under normal, incredible braking loads, they, it's almost impossible, he says, to keep yourself on the bike. You, you kind of want to slide up over the tank. And uh, dropping the leg, the inside leg, provides a tiny bit of wind uh, resistance. Your thigh then moves along the inside of the tank and actually provides more of a lock. Keep, it sounds counterintuitive, but keeps you on the bike rather than having them both of them on the peg. And um, yeah, anyway, go and watch the video. It's, uh, it's very well done. You can watch it in French or because his channel is either French or English. Really well done. It, it, it's all a combination of very, very few improvements, tiny improvements. He does say, though, that even if you're a fast track day rider, it's not going to make any difference because the brakes aren't that good, even on the uh, super duper super bikes nowadays. It won't make you any quicker. It'll probably make you fall off because you're trying to do something. But uh, basically boils down to giving them more, gr more grip on the bike, keeping them clamped onto the bike a little bit more. And even things like, you know, when you pop out from behind the fairing on the brakes, your body acts as a bit of a windbreak. Well, he says even having the leg, your whole leg dangling out there also acts as a tiny little bit of an extra windbreak. And maybe if your foot's dragging on the ground, that's another tiny little bit of extra. So that's the reason they do it. I recommend you go, I'll put the link in the video, you yeah. go and watch it really, really well explained, much better than I've just done. Okay, two, two, two little notes. Quintoli or Quintoli or whatever you call it. He's lived in England now for ages. He's got an English, I think, wife or girlfriend. He has the coolest yeah. accent in the world. It's like this half yes. kind of British. I'm not even sure where, which British or which it's British Leicestershire, it is. It's Leicestershire, yeah. Yeah, Leicestershire. He's got this half Leicestershire with like a tiny, still a hint of French in there. It is the coolest yeah. accent ever. That's the first thing. <laughs> Second of all, okay, two other, two other statements. One was from MotoGP riders. One was Jack Miller. They said, why do you do it? And he also referred to the fact that the foot pegs are extremely high and those bikes are very cramped. And he did it. He says it's simply so during a long race, he can stretch his legs. Cause you know, your legs get a bit cramped, so he stretches. He says it's the only reason he does it. They asked Kel Crutchlow, why does he put his foot out? He said, cause I'm trying to F and stop, you know, obviously with a full word. Yeah. <laughs> Basically he's putting his foot out just cause he's kind of, well, crappied himself a little bit. Um, well, I think yeah, rather okay. than Miller and, Miller and Crutchlow are both just animals on a bike. I think Gantley yeah. is, uh, has analyzed it a little bit more. But yes, I want to sort of agree with you. For the average person, even the fast track day rider, it ain't going to make any difference. Well, here's the thing. Lorenzo wins on it. Another rider who wins a lot, uh, Brad Bender. He doesn't put his foot out either. Uh, Johnny Ray does it yeah. slightly, but not often. And I mean, if it made such... Yeah. And as you said, it, I, I'm telling you now, most of it is just because they feel better doing it. They'd, a lot of them do flat track practicing. Now that's become yeah. a big thing now where they all put their feet out for that. So it just makes them feel better. And I mean, the psychology of a rider is 90% of the riding. True, I'll go with that. So it. yeah, if, if it helps, I don't think that's it. I think watch Gantley's thing. I think it, uh, I think it will add a, another little layer to it, but I agree, tiny, tiny uh, increments. And I'm going to go on to another argument just to end off quickly. Don and I have been having this argument for, for years, basically. We've both been on BMW's GS riding courses. Uh, he's a much better off-road rider than oh, I am. Uh, the thing, especially in South Africa, with it being such an adventure riding uh, place, is that... Anyway, we learned on the GS riding course, the instructors told us, stand up, and when you stand up, and this is the bit that screws with your head, you lower the centre of gravity. Now, Don says this is simply physically impossible. I say it is possible simply because it's got a... Uh, it, it's about adjusting the... Uh, points at which you touch the bike. So when you sat on the bike, you would think you have a lower center of gravity, but most of your weight is on your bum, is going through the seat, much more so than the foot pegs. So you take the weight of the package overall, of the rider and the bike, then the center of gravity is up here somewhere and just below the seat. When you stand up, and hopefully you can see me on the camera over there, but when you stand up, you take all the weight off the seat and then all the weight now goes through the foot pegs. So even though you're obviously higher, the weight of the package overall 
goes through the foot pegs, lowers the center of the gravity of the whole package. Now, Donovan, I can see, is bursting at the seams to tell me I'm an idiot and that GS <laughs> riders in general no. are idiots. So I just, hold on a minute, mate. I just want to say I'm hoping somewhere out there among the viewership on YouTube, one of you or more is good at maths or is perhaps an engineer. Can you give us a definitive answer? Because we're just going to start arguing again. Are you ready? Go, Don. No, hang on. Okay. What, may I just point out, first of all, that when they, when they, I, and I put my hand up, we do these BMW launches, they say, well, we do it because it lowers the center. I put my hand up and I say, well, actually, I'm not going to repeat the word I say. <laughs> yeah. Now, the reason, I mean, we were always taught this, the reason you stand up on an adventure bike or any off-road bike when going through rough bits, not in a parking lot. So you're listening, GS riders, you don't need to stand, sit down. You look like an idiot. You're making us all look bad. Anyway, <laughs> but the reason you stand up on a rough patch is because yes, you kind I understand. of disconnect your body weight from that of the motorcycle. Yes, so the motorcycle can move well. independently. That is yes. why we do it. It's got bugger all to yes. do with the center of gravity. Yes. In fact, center, the higher center of gravity gives you more traction and this and that. And if standing really did so much for center of gravity, why don't MotoGP riders do it around corners? Why don't they lift their butts and put everything through the through the actual foot pegs. They don't. They put all their most, they're holding most of their body weight on the tank, nice and high. It, it's, it's not about, it's not about MotoGP riders, you fool. It's about off-road. I agree with you. It does allow the bike to move independently. That is, I, I'm not saying it doesn't allow it to do that. But to me, we're on about the principle of you standing up, taking your weight away from the seat and putting it through the foot pegs. Does that, please, someone out there with an engineering background or mathematician, school teacher, whatever, is that a fact? If he does that, if you understand what we're on about, is it true that the center of gravity lowers? Yes, we know it allows the bike to move around and all that sort of thing. I want a definitive answer. I actually phoned up Witz University in uh, Johannesburg a couple of times to try and find an engineer to explain it to me, but none of them would. I think they wanted paying, which is kind of awkward in our business because we barely pay ourselves. So that didn't... <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, please, if, if any of you know the answer to that, if you know what I'm talking about, let us know. Let us know in the comments and maybe we can even Skype with you and you can explain it to us all. Don, we have rattled on for quite a while, mate. We have indeed. I think we should say goodbye. Enjoy now. your Lego. <laughs> yes. Uh, I've enjoyed it. We'll see you all very soon. Obviously, you have to stay safe. Keep washing your hands. Keep the social distance. Not as far apart as me and Don, which is about 11,000 kilometres at the minute. And don't go but, to the North you Pole. Know, <laughs> or go to the North Pole. See you later, chaps. Get in contact with us. Stay safe.